Um, I said I'd come to the end of point one. There's a couple of points that I just want to draw your Lordship's attention to that, um, that go to ground one. Um, my Lord, um, could you take out a supplemental bundle and pat into pad one? And I'm on page seven of the bundle. And I refer to this section, but a paragraph 37, I just wanted to show you. There's a 37 that says, in this section, three algorithms are described that could be used in order to detect occluding objects based on, an Im on image properties of the occluding object. And it is those three algorithms that are um, uh, spatial frequency techniques. They're looking at more than an individual pixel. Like our human eye, when we look at the picture, the reason we can see the referee, despite him being in black and white, the reason we can see trousers because they're in black is because we're bringing a higher order processing to it. And that's what the patentee is setting out in 37. And then just going back in similar terms to paragraph 16 on page 4, <coughs> um, this is in the detailed description of the embodiments um, section, which starts at paragraph 7. And over at 16, we're told in terms, the image property of the occluding object relates to a descriptor of a neighborhood of pixels, wherein the description comprises a spatial frequency and wherein the detector is configured to compare a descriptor of the pixel of the detection image to the descriptor of the occluding object. So again, what the patentee is talking about here is object detection algorithms based on a, a descriptor of the neighborhood of the pixel to enable it to look beyond that simple black and white testing. And just on the black and white testing on a pixel by pixel, one further point which arises from the patent which I have mentioned is that the system teaches at paragraph 26, or the patentee teaches at paragraph 26, Paragraph 27, that the billboard isn't needed. And if one thinks about any of the systems that work with a pixel-by-pixel -pixel definition, they're the systems that have billboards, because it's the billboard signature that matters. So you've got a patentee saying, don't need the billboard. And then you're supposed to understand and construe the claim consistently with that teaching. Um, my lords, those are the... Um, you, 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 you've made that point a number of times, Mr. Nicholson, but, but you, you do acknowledge that the claim doesn't, does not not require a billboard. It does require a billboard. Oh, I, I, I do, my lord, and I've made that point clear. Yes. Um, in the claim, it absolutely requires a physical billboard in yep. the real world. Yep. And that is necessary for the parts of the claim which are trying to remove the moving images. That's, that's taught as a separate part of the patentee's mm -hmm. uh, contribution. Yeah. What I am saying is that there isn't a separate part of the patentee's teaching that refers to the detecting of occluding objects. That's, that's taught once, and it's taught in the context where you can do that bit, irrespective of whether you have a billboard or not. Uh, but my Lord, Lord Justice Burr's uh, point is, it is fairly made, and I, I, I don't disagree. Uh, ground two, dark on light object detection is excluded. We can pick this up at paragraph 28 of my skeleton, but the point is that uh, the judge starts to address the point at paragraph 141 of the judgment, and where he summarizes and he accepts Ames' submission that the construction of claim 12 is so broad as to cover pixel by pixel brightness detection, but at the same time exclude the dark on light approach from Nevity. And in so doing, the judge notes himself that he reaches this surprisingly broad yet narrow construction, not without some hesitation. And he gives a list of uh, seven reasons. Turn on myself. He gives a list of um, seven reasons at paragraph uh, 141. Um, uh, each briefly stated for reaching his conclusion. Now, the extreme oddity of the conclusion which the judge has reached on construction, assuming he was right that the image property of the occluding object should be very broadly construed, which I obviously don't accept. 
is that he's construed the claim to cover the systems that could work, but exclude the systems which do work. Sorry, did I say that wrong? Has construed the claim to cover the systems that don't work, but exclude the systems which do work. Nevity is a dark on light system, where the occluding objects appear dark, silhouetted against the bright background of Nevity's uh, infrared illuminated building. And putting aside for the moment whether we're detecting the billboard signature or the object signature, we know the system works. And as we've discussed earlier, a light on dark system doesn't work, except for in the laboratory environment, because although it's possible to make the billboard dark, there's nothing in the systems that makes the foreground objects light. The referee's trousers are black, you can filter them as much as you like, they're still black. Um, you <clears throat> you can't shine a bright light on them, and they're still black. Now, one should not get confused about infrared or bands of infrared in the examples given in the patterns and upon which uh, my learned friends rely, are all being in the visible spectrum. In fact, the infrared analysis ends up with the same result. It just adds a level of complexity because we start talking about black in the infrared spectrum. Now, we repeat what we say about pixel by pixel in respect to ground one. Then we res with respect to the judge, we say it gets worse at ground two because it doesn't work. But of the seven reasons, is point one, the judge says that the consequences vis-a-vis -vis nevity is not an aid to construction. Now we agree and certainly hadn't intended to suggest otherwise. The pattern has to be construed without regard to the prior art. If anything, we say this assists my client because one should not be aiming for tortuous construction simply to avoid catching the prior art. At point two, the judge says it's against AIM that it has argued for a very broad construction of integer 12.5. We agree. Again, this assists our client's case. At point three, here the judge says that both sides agree that the teaching of the pattern was about processing radiation from the occluding object. And it's not clearly, entirely clear what the judge means by this. It makes no sense because no one processes radiation. In the systems as taught, the radiation is detected or not by the various camera configurations. You either detect the radiation or you do not. All of the processing aspects of the pattern piece system are based on the detection image, which is not radiation at all. It's digital data. So it's not entirely clear what the judge means or how he has come to whatever understanding he has. We get something of a hint of the source of the potential confusion from looking at Ames' expert evidence. And by way of example, if one takes supplemental bundle tab 10, and uh, page 159 in the community. I mean, when he says processing, does he just mean detecting? Well, I don't know what he means. I'm do doing my I'm doing my best to understand what he means by that. Well, if he said detecting, would that make sense? Put it that way. Well, it, it's it's not about um, detecting radiation from the from the occluding object as such, because as I sought to make clear to my lords this morning, you get what you get in the camera image. Sometimes, in fact, in all of these systems where uh, you've got the occluding object, because there's nothing to guarantee a brightness or a darkness of the occluding object. You don't control the level of the illumination, and you don't control the nature of the fabric, or the nature of the person's skin, or hair, or eyes. What you get is what you get. And these systems process radiation because they process images in the sense of they take images with the camera and then they process the images. But as far as we mean something more than this all comes down to processing radiation, we don't know what the judge means. We certainly um, don't agree. But the, the point that one sees, for example, in, um, in Ames Expert Evidence on page 159 of the supplemental bundle, 112A, is the language being deployed on the other side. The camera in the Nevity system that is configured to detect the billboard um, 
configured to detect the billboard. But the camera in the Nevity system isn't configured to detect the billboard as such at all. Not in the context of integer 12.5. The camera detects radiation and forms a detection image, which is later processed to detect either objects or billboards, depending on what sort of system you're in. Amalgamating and aligning the camera features from 12.3 with the detection step at 12.5 is making a fundamental error. And in trying to understand what the judge means, we look further at what he says is consistent with this uh, view. He says in, um, uh, in this point, uh, that's consistent thrust of its teaching, common to the fairly general descriptions of paragraphs 13 to 21, and three more specific sections, 30, uh, 33 and following. Now, none of these passages, as far as we can see, use the word radiation at all. So given these cross-references are supposed to support excluding a dark on light system, where the judge assumes the object appears dark, uh, or, sorry, the object appears light, sorry, uh, right, exclude systems in which the object appears dark. What the judge seems to have in mind is that because the pattern detects objects, it can't do so if the object cannot be seen because no light comes from it. And that's actually the same point he then makes in his, his subparagraphs four and five. And <coughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's me, but I'm just going to have a glance at paragraph 13. Mm. At line 16 of paragraph 13, it comes that it's using the colour of the player as a way of detecting an occluding object. And surely that's uh, maybe processing, maybe detecting, as my Lord said, was a better word. But isn't that an example of detecting radiation from the occluding object and using that? Um, um, so, my lord, I'm just picking it up at 16. Right, so what we're being told is the image characteristics of the potential occluding objects may be predetermined and a representation thereof may be stored in the visual models. This idea that we're storing models of objects, for example, shape, color, and texture characteristics of players and or of a ball. Other objects may be predetermined stored in the visual model. Um, uh, yeah, shade, colour, and my lord goes to colour. Yeah. But the well, well, just, just, just Paul, just humour me for a second, Mr. Dickerson. Uh, am I right? I, I say it because I think I am, but I really would like to understand whether I am. That what is contemplated there is using the colour of the occluding object, the colour of a player, to to identify it. That is what that's saying, isn't it? Um, my lord, it is, but it's in the context of all of those individual things. It's not making a promise that the colour of the player is uh, allows you to define the the entirety of the definition of the player. Because otherwise, you're saying, well, all the players agree, for example, and everyone has got to be wearing lycra head to foot green jumpsuits and running around the pitch. It's a different. It's a different case as to what the patentee is talking about here, where we might, for example, describe a football as being a round collection of pixels with black and white hexagons, and the colour is part of the description. In no circumstances does it, would the is does the patentee say, nor would he be understood to say, that you can't include colour within the way in which you're describing objects. But that's completely different to saying this isn't about object detection algorithms at all. This is about a pixel by pixel brightness, and the patentee is expressly teaching that a single colour will do. That isn't what the patentee sets out to do. We're being told about shape, colour, and texture characteristics, which is exactly what we say you do. When you see those red shirts in the hockey game, come through the red filter, you get elements of um, the, uh, the shirt coming through. You can see the creases, you can see the border, you can see the outline. And that's what image detection algorithms um, process. They grab hold of the, um, the uh, collection of pixels in the area and say, this looks like a person to me, 
or this looks like a football. And of course you wouldn't want to exclude shape, you wouldn't want to exclude texture, you wouldn't want to exclude colour. But that's very different to going to the other end of the spectrum and saying, this isn't about object detection algorithms at all. <coughs> Mere pixel brightness will do the job. Does that assist, my lord, um, at least in understanding where I'm coming from? Um, we say that we made clear to the judge all the way through. My own friends say we made some form of concession. We say we made clear all the way through the submissions below, and you can see it in the part that my learned friends have attached a long transcript reference at the back of their additional submissions. If you read the matter as a whole, we were making clear at all times that what really matters for object detection is that there's a border between the background and the object. It doesn't matter whether it's light, whether it's dark, it's the collection of pixels. We also have said repeatedly that the detection of radiation takes place within the camera and it's an entirely separate operation to the detection of image by the detector. At point four, the judge then moves on, <clears throat> staying with the same theme. Conversely, there is no teaching about the use of the absence of radiation from the occluding object. Just pausing there, the, um, the judge is interested in construing the claim, having regard to the teaching, and that's what I'm that's what I'm saying he should have done. He should have looked at the teaching as a whole and purposely construed the claim to accord with the teaching. But he says there's no absence of radiation from the occluding object. What is starting to come through in the judge's list is that the judge has somehow got the idea that objects only appear in the detection image in a light on dark system. And the pattern is about processing the detection image to detect objects. So it must be talking about a light on dark system because there's no teaching about processing objects that can't be seen. And he develops that further in his next point. But uh, let's stay on four for a moment. Mm. Do you agree or disagree with what the judge says that there is no teaching about using the absence of radiation from the occluding object? Um, we agree, my lord. But we also say there's no teaching about using the presence of radiation. The way in which the system is set up is the only thing it's interested about excluding is these moving images on the billboard. Then it forms a detection image with what remains. And there is nothing in the pattern that says the object will always be bright, nothing that says the pattern will always be dark. And as a matter of technical uh, correctness, you will end up in any of these systems with an image in which um, uh, 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 naturally lit objects that have the complex frequency characteristic will have their dark bits represented in the detection issue and their light bits represented in their detection issue. It's, it's what you get from the picture. And the patentee hasn't said they will always appear light, and he hasn't said they will always appear dark. And indeed, if, he, if it intended to do so, and it said it was fundamental to the system that foreground objects always appear bright, as my learned friends are driven to put in their skeleton, then we would be here on a massive sufficiency attack, saying this, this doesn't work, it can't work. <coughs> and that's the mistake the judge has made. And it rolls on into five, where the judge says, that his thinking is that it seems, which seems to span three, four, and five, that even though the image property is broad, I don't think it would be a natural use of language to say that something is being detected when it cannot be seen at all. <coughs> and why he thinks that comes with the next point. He says that 12.3.1 is written so the camera does not detect radiation in the range emitted by the display device. Now, across all of these subpoints, three, four, five, and six, he seems to have got the wrong end of the stick or the wrong end of the clay. He seems to have in mind that 12.3.1 requires that any radiation emitted from the display device must be blocked out of the detection image. And as we touched on this morning, this is wrong. The billboard signature systems that the 
judge has in mind, which are those that produce dark on light images by emitting invisible infrared light, absolutely depend upon light from the billboard reaching the camera and appearing in the detection image. But, th but this isn't light in the one or more predetermined frequency ranges of integer 12.3.1. The light which must be blocked from reaching the camera as a result of that claim integer is specifically the light which is used to display the moving images and none other. So there is absolutely no restriction in the claim about the infrared signature light being picked up by the detection camera. And the judge seems to have misunderstood 12.3.1, which he never expressly um, sought to construe. He's got in his mind that the patentee's teaching and the claim requires that all light from the billboard is excluded. And then you can start to see the genesis of his thinking. If the patentee said, exclude the light from the billboard, the thing that produces a dark on light image, dark object silhouetted, if all of that light is taught to be excluded, then maybe he has excluded um, uh, the dark on light arrangement. But when you realize that that isn't what the patentee teaches, and it's not what 12.3.1 requires, and that light from the billboard, if it's producing light, is picked up by the camera, and light, be it the absence of light or the presence of light, is picked up from the occluding object, whatever arrangement, say for those that are filtered in the moving images on the billboard, the distinction between light on dark and dark on light becomes absolutely fanciful. In a dark on light system such as Nevity, moving billboards, the visible light from the billboard is, uh, is blocked by the camera, but the constant infrared signature, um, which is used to form the detection image, isn't blocked. It is light outside the one or more predetermined frequency <coughs> ranges that is used to display the moving image. Or put another way, the infrared light emitted by Nevity's billboard is neither used to display an image at all, it's invisible infrared light, nor is it used to display a moving image. It's constant. So even illumination, it's an even illumination of the entire surface of the billboard. So integer 12.3.1 doesn't exclude it. It's wrong for the judge to say that the claim excludes all light from the billboard. And therefore, it's wrong for him to be analyzing the claim in the way that he does to come back to all the steps. You never get light from the billboard in this dark on light configuration. Um, we know what you'd see, at least schematically. We've looked at figure three of Nevity. We've looked at the black silhouette. We've looked at the fact that one sees the bright billboard and the silhouette of the player's legs and ball. It's just a schematic representation. And where it matters, as potentially it now does, insofar as infrared light is present in the ambient, there will be some amount of reflection from the player. And the player in the image will not uh, necessarily be black. There will be a degree of grayscale in at least some circumstances. And with all that in mind, the idea that dark on light systems do not result in meaningful radiation reflected from occluding objects um, making its way into the camera and being represented in the detection image is simply wrong. And, that, and then that brings us... Mr. Nicholson, would it be fair to try and encapsulate your submission, or hmm. try to encapsulate it fairly, that, <coughs> that the one might think that the invention is doesn't involve a dark or light system where the light is the light of the moving image, whereas your point is that Nevity isn't that sort of dark or light system because the light isn't the light of the moving image, it's the infrared light. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Yes. Okay. I've been told I'm not making a mistake. Yes. I mean, the, what, why is the patentee filtering out light from the billboard at all. It's because he doesn't want the noise of the moving image appearing in his detection <coughs> image. Perfectly logical position to be in. You don't want Heineken adverts or Eon adverts or Coca-Cola getting mixed up when you're trying to find 
a player or something of that nature. And he teaches, look, you can take you can take account of the fact that all of these in Mrs. Billboard, be they one colour, two colour, three colour, whatever they might be, they all use uh, LED or LED similar type technologies to give you this nice peak of um, a particular wavelength, red, green and blue. We can filter those out, we can still get a very nice image to do our detection in. And all of the noise from the moving has fallen away. That's what he's interested in. He's, he's not, he's not a, uh, averse to signature life on the billboard. He never even acknowledges it. He never deals with it. <coughs> um, yeah, it's not a problem. It's not noise. In fact, because it's continually on and it's uniform over the board, it's actually got the very property the patentee is interested in, which is a monotone and uniform action. What the system is trying to do is to, f oh, sorry, point seven, brings us to the judge's final point, which is that in this dark on light arrangement, the object can be inferred, but one would not say it was detected. But why? The detection image is never intended to be shown to any person. So how a person would describe whether they could see or detect or infer an object is irrelevant. What the system is trying to do is to perform a detection image to allow the system to detect when there's an object or whether or not there's an object in front of the billboard. It's the computer that's doing the detection and it's no doubt equally happy with a nice clear black and white image upon which to perform its detection as a white on black image. The judge's language of whether it's detected or inferred has no place. We respectfully say, taken as a whole, the seven points are in much the same vein and are either factually wrong or taken at their very best. The judge ends up saying that a detection image such as that used in Nevity, there can be no detection of the occluding object because the object is represented by black pixels instead of white. So the object can't be seen, only its silhouette, from which its existence can't be detected, only inferred. We respectfully say that's an extreme approach to construction that has nothing to do with the patent's teaching, or fairly and purposively construing the claims to produce that balance between certainty and fairness. I mean, if the judge is right and 12.5 <coughs> is broad enough to cover mere pixel-by-pixel pixel brightness and image properties of the billboard rather than the occluding object, it applies as much in Nevity's dark-on-light arrangement as in the less useful light-on-dark arrangement. Without the light-on-dark restriction, the pattern is invalid in the light of Nevity, given the common ground that it was obvious to use Nevity with moving image displays. And that, my lords, is the end of my ground two point. That then moves me, it's convenient to do it in this order, to uh, <coughs> Ames conditional amendment. They were tabled with a view to excluding dark on light from the claim in the event that it was wrong about the construction of the granted claim. Now it only arises on this appeal if we're right on ground two and the claim isn't limited to light on dark systems. This is ground six. This is ground six. I'm sorry, I should have said no, that's that. Fine. Um, as we've mentioned, it's unclear whether AIM is still running this fallback position, but it makes sense for me to address it briefly as we dealt with it in our appeal skeleton assuming that AIM would try to rely on it. Now, the judge was only interested, and then Obiter, in Conditional Amendment 1, and actually a very sp a single specific feature of that amendment. Um, and we can pick the claim up on those sheets I handed up later. And if my lords turn to the second sheet, you should be able to see in track changes the insertions that my learned friends sought to introduce. The first this edition... Really, this could only be run by way of responding to notice. Well, my lord, we would say that because my learned friends haven't got a respondent's notice. The decision was that the claim was allowable by the judge 
but it was entirely obiter. There's no order allowing the amendment. Um, so, and there's no there's no cross appeal on allowing the amendment. And there's no respondent's notice. So, my learned friends nevertheless raise it in their their skeleton. Um, I'll, I'll deal with it very briefly, if I may, uh, not least because I'm sure my learned friends will want to try and say something about it, but also because we actually see even more clearly the judge making the same error in respect of this part, the, the, his reason for thinking this amendment worked, as in ground two. So the first edition is the LED billboard, which goes in at 12.1.1.2. Uh, then over the page, oh sorry, it's the uh, bottom of the page if it's printed out, we get the extra 12.7, wherein the LED screen has, screen has a uniform monotone distribution as if it was not active on the capital protection image. Now together these amendments are trying to write in more material upon which to form the view that the billboard must be dark. They don't work. As we've discussed, LED billboards that were part of the CGK didn't necessarily and often would not have a dark background. More importantly, the claim still covers the red LED on white Coca-Cola advertising display that we were discussing earlier. Now, it may be that some LEDs might have a visually black background, but we get nowhere near limiting the claim to that sort of board. On integer 12.7, at paragraph 227, the judge agreed with us the new requirements of the screen being uniform monotone distribution and the occluding objects still being visible, which were added as integer 12.8 in the second amendment, did not help him. The only bit of either of the conditional amendments that the judge thought would have made a difference if he had not already found the dark on light was excluded was the bit about the LED screen appearing as if it were not active on the captured image. And the judge took the view that this would mean that all light emitted from the billboard must be filtered by the camera, so the billboard must appear dark. And with respect to the judge, we say this is a, a straight repetition of the same error that he had <coughs> already made that we discussed in Grant 2. He has misunderstood the teaching to think that the camera forming the detection image excludes all light emitted by the billboard um, and represented in integer 12.3.1. That's not the case. What the pattern teaches is that it's the light that it's emitted to display moving images that's excluded from the detection issue, I image so as to render a billboard that's monotone and uniform. And it's expressed in terms in paragraph 34, which is a sub tab 1. Is this, just again, to make sure I'm, I'm following this. This is all about the word active. Yes. This, is all of this, this issue, the judge construed active to mean, <coughs> to mean effectively, and this is in my words, a, a, an LED screen which is emitting light, emitting, not reflecting, emitting, and and that would therefore exclude a Nevati type system in which infrared light is being emitted. Yes. That, and that's because he interpreted it. That's what active means. Active. And you're saying he's, you're saying he's wrong to interpret it. I, I, I say he's wrong to do so. Yeah. And um, let's have a look at supplemental tab one. And just, just before you get there, sorry. If he's right, then this claim would be excluding dark on light. Uh, yes. yes. I think that. Yeah. I mean, that, that you, you say he's wrong. I understand that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, uh, and then my learned friends need to move a respondent's notice or something in order to try and bring the amendment in. But um, uh, supplemental... Well, I wonder about that because the... I mean, you're the person who's chosen in ground six to raise a ground of appeal about this on the basis that the judge found against you on the amendment. Um, he says he'd have, he'd have allowed it if necessary. He thinks it's not necessary. And you have a ground of appeal saying he was wrong. So I'm not quite sure what respondents notice they need for myself. Well, it, it's, in, it's in the position that um, uh, if I appealed without uh, dealing with this part of the judgment and my learned friend put in a respondent's notice, I would then have to appeal 
against his respondent's notice. So I raised it first time around, but I'm in your lordship's hands as to whether or not to use the respondent's notice. Well, we'd better hear the argument, and if, um, if you want um, to argue that he needs a respondent's notice and hasn't got one, we'll hear that and hear what Mr Alexander says in response. But, um, right. um, my lord, so I'm in um, uh, the patent. Um, uh, supplemental tub one. I am in column nine on page seven, and I'm looking at lines 52 onward. Here, the system describes a um, an LED board with a camera equipped with a special spectral filter. For example, a bandpass filter that only allows light of a small control frequency spectrum. One could choose the spectral bandpass filter such that it falls in between spectral responses of the LED board in the visible light. Illustrated in figure 5b that we looked at earlier, frequency bands, etc. Picking up at the third line at the top of column 10, the image captured by this setup will not be influenced by any changes displayed on the LED screen. Therefore, due to the nature of the screen, the LED screen will have a uniform monotone distribution as if it was not active on the capture detection image. The whole point of this setup is that the light other than that being used to display moving images is not filtered by the camera. Any light which is being used as a signature will not therefore be filtered. The not active that arises in the claim, which is the support for the amendment, as um, my lords will all be aware, you need support in the teaching to start writing things into the body of the patent. And the only support is this paragraph saying that as if not active is because we filtered out the moving images. If you suddenly start saying that not active in the claim means something other than this particular setup, then the amendment's not allowable on added matter basis. But the, the, the fundamental error is that the judge has misunderstood not active as he misunderstood 12.3.1, to think that the patentee is teaching that all light emitted from the billboard must be excluded. And the light from something like Neverty won't offend against the patentee's purpose. The, the infrared band will still be a uniform monotone band in a signature system. It's the invisible light which cannot be used to display a moving image or any image, and it will not stop the screen appearing with a uniform monotone distribution, which is what the patentee wants. One only starts to think that not active applies to all emission from the billboard if one has already made the mistake which the judge appears to have done in paragraph 141. That integer 12.3.1 requires all light from the billboard to be filtered so that it appears dark. And contrary, therefore, to the judge's overture view, he's made the same mistake twice. If he's wrong about dark on light construction um, with respect to the claim as granted, he's also wrong about the effect of the proposed amendment. And as such, the proposed amendments, even if they are being actively pursued by my learned friends, can't help. Are we assisted anywhere by paragraph two of the patent? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, my lord. That's exactly what the patentee is setting out uh, to deal with. Yeah. And uh, my little junior points out at line uh, 19, I think, is it 19? Yeah. Um, uh, in one typical application, active or static boards can extend along the side of the sports filter amongst other announcements, the message displayed by an active screen may be captured by a TV camera and broadcast or recorded special sports event, and then it's the active screen that's, that's being dealt with. That's how the patent is using active. It's one that's got these moving <coughs> image display on. Okay. 
Uh, my lords, unless I can be of any further assistance on ground two, that's uh, ground six. That moves me to ground three, the non infringement. Uh, mm. uh, my lords, this specific grounds runs on the assumption that our appeal on grounds one, two, and if necessary, six have failed. We therefore assume against ourselves that the judge has been upheld on construction, that the claim covers pixel by pixel object detection but excludes dark on light configurations that have never been. And take the point fairly simply. The judge decided that even on this basis, the SVB system infringed because it detected objects on a pixel by pixel basis and had a light on dark channel. For this appeal, we've not sought to raise the infrared 2 channel is never used alone in this um, SVB system. I've mentioned as part of the description. I don't take any um, complaint that the judge bifurcated part of the system. Uh, the judge below somewhat avoided the point um, on the basis that integer 12.5 says based on a detection image. And we're not asking my laws to review that part of the judge's analysis. Our construction point is different. And the only reason I mention this is because my learned friend Skeleton goes to some lengths to explain an alleged handover between the first infrared channel and the second infrared channel, which wasn't found by the judge below, and which is no answer to anything we're actually raising on this appeal. And I'm instructed that this handover point may be an important part of Ames' case in the parallel German proceeding. And whilst I'm not going to waste my Lord's time arguing why my learned friend's skeleton is back. I would, however, ask my Lord's to be careful in the judgment to avoid simply reiterating my learned friend's description as unchallenged, as I don't want to saddle my clients with a concession that gets repeated elsewhere, still less anything that's said to be part of this court's decision. Handover wasn't part of the argument below, and it isn't part of the appeal. My learned friend wants to speak in those terms. My Lord, to be careful. Um, the point we do take is a very simple one. The claim, even construed as the judge has done, is about detecting occluding objects, even if the image property of the occluding object is just simple pixel brightness. Mm. But that's not how the SPB system works. It detects visible parts of the billboard. It's a signature system. If you turn off the billboard's illumination, the infrared illumination, nothing will be detected because the system is looking for the visible billboard's characteristic signature. What it's searching for is image properties of the billboard, not image properties of the occluding object. That is so even though the system can still capture images of the occluding object just as well as any other system can. If the FVB system was detecting occluding based on the judge's notion that the system must be able to capture the occluding objects in the detection image, his whole light on dark analysis, then the SVB system would still work, but it doesn't. Um, looked at another way around, with the infrared turned off, assume the... Okay, oh, I see. Looked at the other way around, Assume that infrared emitters in a contiguous part of the billboard failed. Say a thin vertical column in the middle of the board. The way the SVB system works, it wouldn't overlay the thin vertical column. It would not be able to determine that the column was a visible part of the billboard. That column would be treated in the same way as a thin stick leaning up against the billboard and blocking out the same column of emitters. It's because the system doesn't know about objects, only visible billboard, that it can't distinguish between the two situations. And as the court will appreciate, my client's view is that the judge has pushed the construction of this claim to breaking point already. To go on then to find infringement, the requirement of detecting occluding objects has to be read so broadly as to be infringed by detecting visible billboard. And the judge's reasoning, which is in paragraphs 158 to 162 of the judgment, based on a sufficiently correct 
understanding of how the SPV system works is to equate not detecting the billboard with detecting an occluding object. But as we've seen, the experts considered for quite valid reasons that there is a conceptual and technical difference between the two approaches, as is also made clear in paragraph 27 of the patent. Oh, Mr. Nicholson, paragraph one, you refers to paragraph 158, but I can't find detecting the language you said. Is oh, yeah. Paragraph I mean, maybe he's using synonyms, I don't know, but I'm trying to follow your submission. I'm almost certainly paraphrasing. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, it's the bottom of 158, my lord. If it is dim by this measure, that indicates an occluding object blocking the infrared from the board, which would otherwise have been made the pixel bright. This is IR channel 1. Yeah. But then he, t he takes the same approach um, as he carries on um, with the finding. Yeah, yeah, 162, when the IR channel 2 processing is also in use, a pixel within the expected bounds of the board is considered to correspond to an occluding object, whether either the IR1 threshold or the IR2 ratio so indicate, hence the OR gate. But the language is wrong. It's never considered to correspond to an occluding object. That's to elide what the system is doing, finding parts of the billboard with corresponding to an occluding object. What, what I'm, 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 I'll tell you frankly, I'm at sea. What, what I thought your ground three was, was a point on construction of the claim. Hmm. What this seems to be is an argument about fact, about what your system is doing. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying one way or the other whether your title is right or whatever, but I just, I'm just confused about the, the argument you're putting to us, because I thought you were putting a point on construction when you tell us what ground three is, but then when you look at the judgment, you seem to be dealing with questions of fact rather than questions of construction of the yeah. claim. My, my Lord, the point, it is a point of construction. I'm sorry for okay. my lack of clarity. The what, is, and the words in construction that, we're, that you're considering are detecting an, an occluding object. Yes. That's, that's the issue. And what construction do you say the judge put on it which you say is wrong? Well, the, the construction the judge put on it that was wrong is by the time he comes round to applying it as he is here in the infringement context, even though he's got a system which isn't detecting an occluding object, he's saying, well, if it's not billboard, then it's occluding object. That's detecting occluding object. So it's a construction point in the sense of when you've got experts who are saying that whether you go for the billboard or whether you go for the object, are technically and conceptually different systems. And there's no dispute as to what the SVB system does technically. What the judge is expressing here is, well, it is detecting objects because it's detecting that it isn't billboard. That's a construction issue that says... Um, uh, well, I mean, I don't know whether the judge is referring to this specific point that I'm about to make or not, but mm. I, I thought we'd agreed this morning that the that your system, the SVB system, does, when, when the IR2 channel is being used, it takes a pixel which is inside what we know as an occluding object and, and measures it against the pixel in the other channel and makes a decision about whether it needs to be within the mask or not based on, its, based on, the, on the intensity of that pixel. The relative intensity. That's right, isn't it? It does, my lord. And, and, it's, and it's, it, it is, at least from our perspective, it could be said to be treating it as an occluding object. And it's doing that, surely. Because the point is, you don't put the you don't put the advert for whatever it is on top of the occluding object. And it won't put the advert on top of that pixel because it's worked out that that pixel is a pixel not to put the advert on top of. My lord, it comes back to the same system. All of these systems, whether never to SVB or other, work. They don't put the advert on top of a player who's standing in front of the billboard. We go into the trial where the experts are agreed that there is a technical and conceptual difference between a system 
that detects occluding object by looking at the image property of the occluding object. And another type of system, which doesn't know anything about object, but is looking for a defining characteristic of the billboard. The judge goes through the claim construction, and the construction that he has implicitly put on this part of the claim when he comes to the infringement is that even though the claim says detecting occluding object, that is satisfied by a system that detects the visible pictures of the, uh, the visible signature of the billboard. And he's therefore ripped a construction through the patentee's teaching so that this claim now teach now covers the signature system which is technically and conceptually different to what the patentee has taught. <coughs> I don't understand that submission yeah. because, as I've understood it, when the IR2 channel is operating, yes. the system identifies, and this is, on the, this is all on the premise, and I know you say it's not right, that's your grounds one and two, I get that. But this is on the premise that you've lost on those points. So the claim covers pixel brightness system. Yes. Yeah? In, in the context in which the IR2 channel is operating, the system measures the brightness of the pixel, which is the pixel on a, which, which, we, which we know, but it doesn't, is the pixel on a player. And it decides not to put the advertisement on top of that pixel only by reference to the properties of that pixel compared with the same pixel in the other image. It's not comparing that pixel with uh, where it thinks the billboard is. That's right, isn't it? Is that right? It's not looking at where the billboard is. Am I right? My lord, let me, let me just clarify about okay. your lordship. First of all, it's looking at the contrast between the channel one and the channel two. Yes. And why it's interested in the contrast is because it knows the contrast is always guaranteed to be high for a billboard pixel, okay. the cor uh, pixel that corresponds to the billboard. And if it's low, it doesn't correspond to the billboard. Right. It's not correct to say that if it's not the billboard, it is an occluding object. And the easiest example of that is assume I've got a slightly broken billboard. The ball has gone into it, and the little panel has stopped working. That will be treated in the SVB system as if it were not visible billboard. But it's not an occluding object. Okay. And that's because, because... For the purpose of this system, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pixel onto which the advertisement is not to be put. Of course. And, and the decision not to, do, to, to not put the, the advertisement on that pixel is made entirely by reference to the quality, the, the intensity of that pixel as measured by the IR2 camera and that pixel as measured by the IR1 camera. Yes. And that's right. Yes. But just like in the ordinary billboard, in the signature systems, using where the billboard is is an add-on. It's an extra. They all look for pixel brightness. So when you look at Nevity itself, it looks for a bright pixel. And if it's a bright pixel, it ascribes it to billboard. And if it's a dark pixel, it ascribes it to not billboard. But Nevity, on the judge's own approach, isn't detecting objects. We will look at what he actually comes on to say. And he says, when looking at the prior art, it would be wrong to say it's detecting objects. At best, it can be said that it infers objects. And to take my Lord Lord Justice Burse's point, if you apply the same reasoning to the SVB system, and we don't agree with this analysis, but if you do apply it, at best, you can say, the SVB system isn't detecting including objects. It's only inferring it. Now, wherever, wherever, you, wherever you land in the spectrum of detection and inferring on how you approach Nevity and how you approach the SVB system, my clients are entitled to consistency from the judge. If Nevity, looking at individual pixels and saying, if it's bright, it's billboard. If it's dark, I infer it's an object. If that's the correct way to look at Nevity, then when you look at the SVB system, it works in the same way. 
what the judge has said is that the SVB system goes looking for the billboard, and what it doesn't find as billboard is object. Well, that's detection. You infringe. But on Nevity, it goes looking for the billboard, and if it finds, it, if it doesn't find it, it can only infer it's an object. Therefore, Nevity doesn't take out the pattern. And my client says, look, there's scope for difference, particularly once you get to this stage where I've already lost on grounds one and grounds two. Whatever the judge wants to do on infringement, he's got to be consistent between his approach to the prior art and his approach to, um, uh, approach to the infringing system. As I say, we don't consider the whole detect, defer, detect and infer distinction as any proper place at all. But if the judge is going to use it, he must do it consistently, using his construction analysis in which the detection is different from inferring. The SVB system doesn't detect. At the very best, the judge would say it inferred. Um, and we say my clients are entitled to consistency in the approach. And I very much get um, my Lord Lord Justice Burse's point that it's really easy when you're looking at these systems and you're saying, well, they don't end up putting adverts over players' legs. They must be understanding, I'll use that term to define it, understanding where the objects are and they're working. But we went into this trial and throughout this trial with the experts saying there are two different types of systems here, technically and conceptually different. When it comes to nevity, it's considered to be technically different. It doesn't detect it in first. When it comes to SVB, apart from this dark on light, light on dark, issue, which we're separately discussing, the judge's view is, well, you can go looking for the um, billboard as much as you like, but if you work out which the billboards are and don't overlay the rest, then you are you are detecting the object. So that's just inconsistent. Um, the two parts cannot be reconciled in a fair way. Um, my lords, unless I can be um, of any further um, assistance on that point. That brings me to my ground four, which is an erroneous approach to obviousness. Um, we set out in our skeleton at paragraph 49 on page 18. The point relates to what we called nevity OD, or nevity object detection in trial, which is the contention that it was obvious to implement nevity with object detection. The appeal point only practically arises if we're right about the construction under grounds one and two. And in those circumstances, we don't infringe, but we're entitled to continue to revoke the patent. And that would be in circumstances where my lords had held that you needed a proper object detection process for integer 12.5. Now, the issue is this. Both sides observed in their main report that when... Sorry, I don't understand that. Sorry. I'm, so sorry. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. No, 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 it's my fault. If, if the Nevity OD argument is an argument, as I understand it, is, is an argument to say that it was obvious to add to a higher layer object detection to Nevity. Yes. If the, well, why does it matter whether the claim is, includes pixel by pixel? It, it, I mean, it, it includes higher layer detection, surely. It just, it just may not be limited to it. But you, but you seem to be very clear this depends on you winning um, your point on construction. Um, I, can, I can see my law's point. If um, I think it really raises it this way, that if, if claim one, yeah, if, if, if ground two succeeds, um, then the patent's already invalid without me needing to add object detection. If the claim is limited to object detection, as I say it should be, then I need to add object detection to nevity for it to be invalidating prior art. I see. This is this this depends this this matters if you this isn't really about ground one at all, it's about ground two. Uh, I think it, from my perspective it goes 
goes both ways, because I say the right answer to ground one is you need a proper object detection mechanism in, uh, in yeah. play. But does anyone say so your, your it, lordship it, it, is it right that the, the otherwise invalidity arises on, uh, on if the patent's or it doesn't matter if the patent's already invalid, because levity is not excluded, that's my ground. And, 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 and the relevance of ground two is that this argument doesn't work, and you don't say that it should, if you're wrong on ground two. Um, I wasn't contemplating winning on ground one and losing on ground two, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean your lordship has the, has the argument. Ground two fails. Putting completely aside ground one, I'm not making a statement about whether it fails or succeeds, but if ground, ground two, which excludes dark or light, excludes nevity in a way which this argument doesn't get you inside. Because all this is about is adding image processing to nevity. Yes. So you have to win ground two for this argument to be relevant. Yeah. Um, if we've. Yeah, that's not. Um, Lord Justice is putting to me that if I've lost on ground two. And nevity is excluded completely because it has an emitting billboard. Then it can't help me adding object detection. That must be right. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. No, no. Um, so this is this is an erroneous um, approach to obviousness. Both sides experts observed in their main report when considering the skilled person implementing nevity that the skilled person would perceive a potential problem. Namely, that it would have difficulties when operating in very high levels of ambient sunlight. And the problem arises because in such conditions, it's at least possible that some part of an occluding object might be sufficiently reflected in the infrared band to mimic the high infrared signature emitted by the billboard, leading to, the ob to occluding objects potentially being mistaken for billboards. Um, as it happens, it was the very issue which the SBB system uh, solved with its second channel. But both experts in their main report, having identified this aspect of nevity, that obviously warranted further consideration. They both each went on to give a number of high-level proposals that they considered would have been obvious to the skilled person without invention to address the problem. Now, although the solutions were at high level, and although there were a number of happens when one isn't led by hindsight. They were at the same level of generality as the teaching of the pattern. And one of the proposals from my client's expert was to implement an object detection algorithm to work on the detection image to better decide whether pixels which looked like they might be part of the billboard were more likely associated with an including object. Dr. Thomas, in reply, didn't disagree with Professor Speed, that the idea would occur to the skilled person without invention. The entirety of his response was limited to his preference for his own suggestions and highlighting the practical downsides that a number of Professor Speed's suggestions would result in a more complex system. They would require more processing power. They would be more difficult to test and the like. And of course, Dr. Thomas's alternative solutions weren't without their own downsides either. <coughs> but more importantly, none of the additional complexity required by Professor Speed's proposals was said to be uh, an impediment. In fact, most were inevitable. If you build a more advanced system, it will likely be more complicated, require more processing power, and be more complicated to test. That's life. And of course, insofar as one is worried about the difficulties involved in implementation, none of these issues are even mentioned, let alone solved by the pattern. And there was a live insufficiency squeeze, as the judge records, in paragraph 213. And of course, as was necessary to avoid insufficiency, Ames' evidence from Dr. Thomas was that object detection algorithms of this higher order nature were part of the common general knowledge and that the skilled person would be well able to implement them. 
Now at that point, one might have thought that Safanor was home on him, on the narrower construction of object detection to which my clients advocate. It's long been the law that when multiple paths are all technically obvious to the skilled person, any one of them coming within the scope of the claims renders the pattern obvious. And we put Palmas citing Brugger and Medicaid in the authority fund. It's never been the law that more is expected of the skilled person for obviousness than has been provided by the patentee. But the judge rejected the argument. In so doing, the judge demanded too much of this type of obviousness in my act, we say. He actually sets out his reasons starting in one of the earlier obviousness attacks, a paragraph 194 of the judgment. Um, which is expressing a similar point about Professor Steed's evidence on one of Sapanor's other obviousness grounds that we're not appealing. At 194, the judge says, persuasive reasons for the skilled person to think or act in a particular way are always a key element of an expert's report supporting an obviousness attack. Now, that may in certain instances be correct, especially if the court is being asked to determine a difference of opinion between two experts. One sees the route, the other does not. What then is to be preferred? One has to look for the persuasive reason. Now in the present case, we're not talking about a route to obviousness that has to be fought over. Would it be seen or would it not? Are there a sequence of steps? Might do this, might do that, might do something or else. You've got a whole tree of possibilities. Here, the relevant idea was common general knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, the relevant idea um, would have occurred to the skilled person without invention. Yes, there were other ideas, and it may be that some would have been preferred. But the lack of persuasive reasons for the skilled person to act in a particular way is not this type of case. We put it like this. If the skilled person sat at his or her desk, had, without invention, on picking up and reading Nevity, perceived a problem, or even a potential problem, with that prior art, as both, agree, both experts agreed they would, and turned to mi their mind to what they could do about it, and conceived of the patent solution at the requisite level of detail, as we say they did, then the patent is technically obvious. It matters not whether, as a matter of practical application, the skilled person would try other ideas or think of other ideas first. It matters not whether the skilled person might, despite their misgivings as to the prior art, have implemented the prior art exactly as taught, and then conducted an exercise to see just how bad the perceived problem was before deciding did they need to deal with any problem or um, make any potential improvement. Oh, That's I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm confused by that. The, I mean, maybe you didn't mean to say it, but you said something didn't matter when the skilled person might do something. But isn't might nowhere near close enough, high enough to the standard for obviousness to get you anywhere? Um, so th I was saying that you wouldn't do this. The, the, where the judge seems to conceive is that... Um, a skilled person um, might choose to implement nevity as it was and then evaluate to see how bad the problem was before committing to doing anything about it. And I say it doesn't matter what a real engineer might have done in that context. If a real engineer said, well, look, I've got a system as it is. I think I'm going to have a problem with it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a problem with it. But I'll implement it, and then I'll evaluate it, and then I'll choose which of my ideas to fix it. Because that's the practical implementation. If the skilled person has already sat at their desk and said, this is a terribly interesting piece of prior art. I'm interested in implementing it, but I can see bright sunlight's going to be a problem. If bright sunlight turns out to be a problem, is it all over? Or have I got any ideas of what I would do to fix it? And in this case, still sat at their desk, the skilled person, the experts 
looking through the eyes of the skilled person, both of them said, I think bright sunlight is going to be a problem with this system. And both of them came up with ways to deal with that. And you say the judge was wrong in 187, 187, and she makes the point that you've made that um, it might present practical problems in bright sunlight. So he then qualifies it by saying, however, the expectation would be provisional rather than general. And that sort of strikes me as being an important finding which is against you about the motivations of a skilled person. It doesn't sound you know, like, is, that, is he wrong? Is he, is, is he, was it open to him to come to that conclusion? Um, uh, my Lord, just to make sure that we picked it up in the right place, because mm -hmm. um, uh, my Lord is dealing with this specifically on the Nebuty OD paragraph of 213. I know, but I'm, I'm, yep. you're making the point about the skilled person reading Nebuty and thinking there might be a problem with bright sunlight, mm. and, and going from there. And I'm putting to you that the judge appears in 187 to have qualified how, how what, the, what the skilled person would think about that. They would see that there might be practical problems, but their expectations wouldn't be general. They would be provisional. In other words, they're not they're not thinking, I know this is going to be a problem and I'm certainly going to do something about it. They're thinking, oh, there might be a problem. We'll see. I yes. don't know. Yeah. Um, my Lord, I say in this particular case, the perceiving of the potential problem is good enough. Okay. Because in both experts, um, uh, both experts' evidence was that it was enough of a perceived problem to go on to think about solutions. That sounds like a polite way of saying you do say that 187 is wrong. No. The expectation of potential practical problems would be a provisional rather than a general one. It would be a provisional one on okay. the judge's findings, but it would be provisional enough for me to think about it, and to, or for the, uh, the skilled person to think about it and start thinking up solutions. Because what matters is whether the skilled person without invention has a reason to come up with a solution that falls within the claims of the patent. Mm -hmm. And your lordship is absolutely right that life is full of degrees of certainty. Mm -hmm. There are points that one knows are going to be raised, for example, when one comes to a court hearing. Um, there are ones that one doesn't contemplate. And there are ones that you can't be sure whether the judges are going to raise with you or not. But you do continue to think on. I'll wait and see what happens when I get there. It may be raised, it may not. But it's enough of a possibility for me to think about what the answer is going to it to be. And in this case, both of the experts, looking through the eyes of the skilled person, said, I'm seeing the problem clearly enough for me to think about, the skilled person would think about solutions. And I say in a case such as this, that is enough. Um, And then picking up, just jumping over where I am, I pick up at 2.13 and 2.14. The judge at 2.14 finds that the points that were made by Suffolk's expert were too vague. The general need to think about bright ambient conditions does not mean that the skilled person would positively expect there to be a problem, still less a specific one. Fine, I'll take that. But if it's enough to cause the skilled person to say, I can see that there might be a problem, and, I'm, and it's enough to motivate me to think about how I would deal with it if it arises in practice, then that's good enough. And he balances that with Ames' point that Nevity was a simple solution that could be expected to work. Well, only so far because both experts looked at it and said, yeah, it's a good solution. I'm interested in taking it forward, but I can see there's going to be a problem. I'm going to think about what I'm going to do about that should I actually find that problem's big when I build the system. Then at 2.15, the judge says, takes into account Professor Steve's evidence, was not informed by specific expectations of how Nevity would perform. And as with the other attack, Nevity Plus, 
his written evidence relied on in support of FDOD, especially in his first report, was not more than that certain techniques formed a list of things that would or might be considered. This is much too vague to support obviousness. And we say, in short, putting all this together, um, the judge was setting the standard that a specific proposal based on a specific expectation that Nevity would need improving in, uh, uh, in distinguishing objects and a specific choice would, not could, be made, as he actually emphasised in paragraph 192 of the judgment. And we say this is setting the standard for obviousness too high in a case where both experts led high-level proposals in their first report on the basis that the skilled person would be motivated to think about improvements in this particular respect. And one of those landed on the pattern. That's enough. We say this is all the more so when one bears in mind that the experts have to go out of their way to avoid hindsight, putting any knowledge of where the patentee has put his flag out of his mind. So an expert report properly prepared inevitably ends up not jumping on a particular line. If there's eight things occur to the, the expert looking through the eyes of the skilled person, would be obvious, then they need to be set out in the expert report before he sees the pattern. And on the judge's approach, where prior art has a potential problem, and there's more than one potential single step common general knowledge solution to it, we respectfully say it almost always be impossible um, to meet the judge's requirement. That they would see the problem, that they would understand the scale of the problem with particulars, which could only be ascertained by building the prior art, they would then land on and only land on the specific technique claimed by the patentee and would have a strong expectation that the specific technique would solve the problem. We say that's far, far too high. It's sufficient that a skilled person did perceive of at least a likelihood of a problem and did think of the patentee's solution as one of the possible CGK worries to resolve it. A single step when faced with a problem that both experts identify. Put the other way, how can there be invention in claiming one of the common general knowledge ideas which would have come to the skilled person's mind when they were sat at their desk reading <coughs> the Nevity prior art? Uh, my learned um, junior passes me um, Dr. Thomas's evidence that the skilled person would be aware that in the live sports event context proposed by Nevity, there would be issues that would need to be addressed to ensure that the system functions properly and reliably. That was Ames expert evidence. Um, Oh, sorry, that's um, paragraph 126 on page 138 of the supplemental bundle. Um, my lords, that brings me to the end of that obviousness point, subject to anything my lords have. And that brings me on to my final ground, ground five, the consequences of invalidity of claim one. Now, what happened in this case is rather unusual, and the question of law which arises from it appears to have been materially misunderstood by the judge. At the PTR, which was held only a couple of weeks before the trial, the judge was very concerned about the complexity of the trial, the number of issues, and the short time allocation. And you may have noticed from the front of the um, uh, judgment, we actually ended up sitting for the trial and then coming back later for closing submissions. In encouraging the judge to hear the case of Plans, AIM emphasised that the only claims in issue were Claim 1, Systems Claim, and Claim 12, Method Claim. There are no substantial differences between those two claims. It followed that if Claim 1 was invalid, then the whole patent would have to be revoked. And indeed, that had been the case, the, 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 that had been the state of the case for months. All of the evidence was filed considering only Claim 1 as standing for both Claim 1 and 12, and that's the case both sides were expecting to find. And for reasons that have never been fully explained, 
a few days before trial, AIM wrote saying that it would no longer contend that Claim 1 was valid. In its skeleton for an interim hearing on the issue, AIM came off the fence and said, as we quote in paragraph 59 of our skeleton, that it would no longer contend that Claim 1 was valid over nevity. AIM, however, made clear that it wished to carry on relying on Claim 12. Now, there is and was no complaint from Suffernor based on the last minute messing about. So, so I'm just pausing, Mr. Williamson. It was always clear to you that what they were saying was claim one was invalid, but claim 12, their case was it was valid. Uh, after, in the, in the run-up of... Um, uh, once they said they weren't relying on claim one, <laughs> yes, it was absolutely clear they were saying they were continuing with claim 12. Yeah. No, doubt, no doubt about that. And I'm going, to make, I'm going to make that clear in a moment. Um, the claims are material identical. The expert evidence not dependent upon the fine wording of the claim. The issue which my clients raise and raises again on this appeal is purely one of the legal consequences of AIM's admission as to the invalidity of claim one. Contrary to what the judge seemed to think, and I believe my Lord Lord Justice Burris was raising with me just now, Suppenor never thought that AIM was deliberately throwing in the towel. Of course it was. It wanted to keep its patent, but to argue the case on Claim 12 rather than Claim 1. That's all. The point which my client raised is that as a matter of law, whether this course was open to AIM. Litigants, including those professionally represented, make mistakes as to the consequence of a step they take or fail to take from time to time. Their opponents are entitled to point out when such mistakes have been made, and in their own best interest, are entitled to take whatever legal point arises as a consequence. Litigation is not a benevolent process where one side is obliged to raise their opponent's errors. And Suppenor's position is that it was entitled to take the legal point in exactly the same way it would be entitled to take a point, for example, that the Limitation Act or some other unextendable deadline was missed by a day. In such a case, it's readily apparent that the mistaken party didn't intend to junk their entire claim. But the fact they made a mistake as to calculating the date and served a day late is irrelevant. The, con the consequence of your submission is that litigants will be deterred from making pragmatic concessions in order to simplify trials? No, no, my lord. Um, uh, litigants can continue to make concessions in exactly the way they always have. They need to be careful about what they're doing. So in the normal case where you've got, for example, um, uh, uh, independent validity, which is the usual way we narrow the claims. I rely on claim one, but if, I'm, if, but if claim one turns out to be invalid, I don't make anything of claims two, three, four, five, and six, but I would like to rely on claim seven when dependent on claim one. That sort of concession is made all the time. I can also make a concession between process and method claims. Um, uh, I want to fight the case on the apparatus claim, claim one. And if that turns out to be invalid, I don't require the court to look separately at the method claim 12. What I don't do is come out and say, well, claim, one, claim 12 is invalid, and then not expect to have the consequences visited on me with respect to claim one. So you've got to be very careful what one's doing. And the idea that um, parties can just allow claims to be revoked because they would rather the court focus its attention on some other part of their monopoly, a monopoly that they've maintained for perhaps anything up to 20 years prior to that point, is wrong. And as we explain in our skeleton, this is a particular issue with respect to the revocation of patent claims. You can't surrender a claim for revocation voluntarily. There is a process under Section 29 of the Act where I can choose to surrender a claim of my patent, but a claim can only be revoked 
which has different legal consequences in circumstances where, as is relevant to this case, the court is satisfied that the claim does not involve an invention. Is that right, over Mr. The Prana? Just to be clear, surrendering is, dif I agree with you, is yes. different from revocation. I agree with that. Yes. Surrendering means your, the claim ceases to have effect, but, but merely the surrender doesn't mean that it didn't have effect in the past. And in that sense, it's completely different. But that's not the same thing as saying, as you just have, that you can't um, accept that a claim is revoked by consent. But I thought claims are revoked by consent all the time. Um, cases. Well, you telling me that that's not po legally possible? Yeah. I mean, the problem is that we're in a um, statutory um, regime. Well, I know that, but but uh, it is just to be clear. Your submission is, is it, that you can that, that the court has no jurisdiction to revoke a claim by consent. That's correct, my lord, because the court only has a power in proceedings before the court under under section seventy two for the revocation of the patent mm -hmm. and the grounds upon which the patent can be um, revoked have to be made out. Now, I'm sorry, I probably mis misanswered this this question just now because it's it's not that you can't consent to the revocation, but there is a factual basis that goes with that consent. The court has only got the power to revoke the patent if it is satisfied that it lacks um, patentability. It's not new or um, lacks inventive step, plus there, there, there are the other um, listed items, at least the one that arises in this case. So when I, um, when I admit the other side's claim, or vice versa, and say, I accept that claim one is invalid and should be revoked. I'm not only I'm not just consenting to its revocation. I have to admit it's invalid because otherwise the court doesn't have the basis to revoke the claim as lacking patentability. It's the it's the interpretation of the admission that you are in fact making to come within the court's power. The court has to be satisfied that the patent is invalid. Yeah, so the point my, my learner junior makes is that when grounds for invalidity are pleaded, um, as they were in this case, and uh, the patentee says, I will admit that part of the claim, as in the, the legal claim, then the court's entitled to be satisfied that it's common ground that the grounds are made out, that its power under section 72 is engaged, and can accept, as the judge did in this case, that claim one is invalid in the light of nevity, and uh, revoke the patent, or revoke that claim of the patent, which is exactly what's happened. Claim one has been revoked already. But then you've got to look at the consequences of that, because it's an implicit part of the admission that there is nothing invented in claim one. My clients are entitled to raise, as they did in those days before trial, what do you say is the, the technical distinction between claim one, which you accept is invalid in the light of nevity, and claim 12, which you want to continue to defend? And at no stage in the process have my learned friends been able to identify any technical distinction between claim 1 and claim 12. As we've pointed out, and we, we focus on the integers that we've really been focusing on, 12.3 and 12.5, we pointed out in our skeleton, um, probably worth turning it up, Uh, on page 23 of the skeleton, which is uh, 42 of the core bundle. We set out the integers of claim 1 on the left-hand column and the integers of claim 12 on the right-hand column. In claim, all of the black text is identical. What's changed 
is a camera image interface for receiving in the apparatus claim has been capturing in claim in the method claim a detector for detecting hard apparatus in the product claim has been replaced with detecting in uh, claim 12 and the, you can look at the entire claims piece by piece there, there's nothing between them it was common ground that there was no technical distinction between these and we say how can you accept that Nevity in, um, invalidates claim 1 without showing a technical distinction between claim 1 and claim 12 um, going forward and regrettably the judge appeared to be um, and he was very cross about the whole point describing the point in his judgment as fallacious a 263 and a 269 saying that he doesn't believe that any reasonable person in the position of Suffernor would have interpreted his aim's conduct as admitting by implication that quote, claim 12 was invalid I also don't think that Suffernor in fact thought that I think Suffernor's conduct was and has been opportunistic and a distraction the judge was furious about the point being run well, all of that is true, isn't it? It is. I it mean, you say it is opportunistic. You'll say you're entitled to do it. So the judge isn't wrong. He's just um, it's, it's just the characterising what you did. Exactly. And, and my point is, 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 is absolutely this. Look, this is a, a legal point taken, like Limitation Act. It's not that we misunderstood. We know what they wanted to do. But what they, in fact, did was accept that in the light of nevity, no invention lies in producing a system falling within the scope of claim one. Now, the Let's only thing... Stop that, Mr Nicholson. Yeah. Just bear with me for a second. Where exactly is that is that concession? I just want to see it. Uh, uh, that it's in the light of nevity. No, no, where is it? In the papers? In the bundle? Um, the I want to see the concession you rely on. It was um, in the skeleton before uh, Mrs. Uh, Joanna Smith, the interim skeleton, okay. where they explained what it was. Where is it? It's not in the bundle, my lord. Okay, we better hand it up, I think. I'll hand it up. While you're handing it up, can you tell me, does it explain why the um, <coughs> one is invalid over? No. So, in, so it could be invalid over Nevity on the basis that Nevity discloses a device which is capable of doing the things required by Claim 1, but does not in fact do it. Yes, and I was going to come on to that point. In which case, Claim 12 wouldn't be invalid on, based on that reasoning. That's that, right, isn't it? I understand my Lord's point. I can come on to deal with the uh, apparatus compared mm -hmm. to the method. Well, but, but I'm right, aren't I? My Lord, there are circumstances where sometimes a product claim um, uh, can be uh, anticipated a method, a method claim is not. or obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and it, but it's not obvious to use it mm -hmm. for the method. Mm -hmm. That This is not such a case. Now, isn't this such an admission? No. The admission doesn't deal with that, does it? No. So the admission could be true or on that basis. And you don't have any way of saying whether what's admitted is that, is, is that example or not? My Lord. I'm right, aren't I? Your Lordship is right. Yeah. But even if I assume that the admission was on that basis, the case for the invalidity of the method claim in the particular circumstances of this claim is clearly made out. Perhaps I can come on to that after I've shown you what was said in the skeleton. What, what is the document you've handed so up to see so what we've got? This is Ames skeleton. For, for an interim hearing before Mrs. Justice Joanna Smith in the period immediately before the trial. The hearing actually never took place. After the other side um, uh, notified us that it was giving up Claim 1, and we started asking what the technical distinction was between Claim 1 and Claim 12, and there was a lot of correspondence. They were deeply concerned that they needed permission to withdraw a concession, and they filed an urgent application uh, that was due to come on before Mrs. Justice Joanna Smith. 
after exchange of skeleton arguments, my then learned friend and I agreed that it wasn't necessary to um, uh, trouble the court with an urgent application, okay. but rather the application could be heard over and the point could be taken at trial, which is what then happened. Well, I'm, I'm puzzled because we've got the order of Mrs. Justice Jenna Smith, which is at tab 15 of the supplementary bundle, yes. and a recital at page 201 upon the claimant notifying the defendant by letter dated 18th October that it no longer contends in these proceedings that claim one is valid. And this skeleton, and, and that seems to be a reference to the concession, so I would have thought we would be looking at the letter of 18th of October if we want to know what was said, whereas what you've handed up is plainly something that happens after this date. Ah, my reason for showing you this document, my lord, rather than the letter, because the letter just said, um, in effect, we no longer want to rely on claim one to the extent that it could be looked at. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we exactly. no longer contend it's valid, was the, was the language yes. in the letter. The difference between that document and this skeleton is that in paragraph 12 of the skeleton, it said the proper scope of claim one was not appreciated until the 18th of October 2022 at which point Amesport indicated that it would no longer contend that Claim 1 was valid over Nevis. And that's important, because Claim 1 is not valid, and it's not valid over the cited prior art in the proceedings. Well, to be accurate, it says they would no longer contend it was valid. That doesn't, that doesn't actually say it is invalid. It says they would <coughs> no longer contend it's valid. Um, my lord, it was common ground they were no longer contending that it was valid and that, it, that, that the conditions of the Act were made out such that the court had power to revoke the claim for not having an inventive step. It doesn't say that here, does it? No, it doesn't. But that's what subsequently happened, and that's what they were content to happen, that the claim would be revoked. What I'm trying to understand is, are you relying on the recital to the order of Mrs Justice Smith? Are you relying on this statement in the skeleton? Are you relying on the fact that revocation order was made. It sounds like every time we look at one thing it then turns out you're relying on something else and then you're relying on something else. And I really do want to understand exactly what it is you're relying on. I'm relying on after various skirmishes by the time we turned up at trial it was Ames' position that claim one was not valid over Nevity and should be revoked. That's how we went into the and in response to which, my client said, I can see, and it's common ground between the experts, that there is no technical distinction between the subject matter of Claim 1 and the subject matter of Claim 12. So where do you say the invention is? Where do you say the invention is? Now, my Lord Lord Justice Burke rightly raised the only possibility that seems to exist. It was never raised by Ames it was raised as, as a speculation by the judge that it may have been the case that there was uh, it was obvious to make a product falling within the product plan, but it wasn't obvious to use it to be a digital image overlay system. The problem with that is we aren't talking about an accidental anticipation where um, the claim is to a corkscrew and I found some tool in the workshop that has all the features of the claim. But nobody would think of picking up that object that has all the features of the product claim and using it as a corkscrew. Here we're talking about prior art, which is a digital image replacement system for use in sporting events to allow the replacement of advertising material. It's said to be either anticipated or obvious to come within the scope of claim one. If the invention is said to lie in having the idea for using Nevity for the very thing it says it, it presents itself as for, then it was incumbent upon my learned friends to come forward and say so. In, in a case where there was never any misunderstanding about the fact that AIM continued to rely on claim 12, 
why shouldn't they say at trial, well, we rely on claim 12, if there's no technical distinction between that and claim 1, maybe we were wrong to abandon claim 1, but anyway, we've done it and it's too late, but uh, I don't see why that should affect continued right to rely on claim 12. It's the approbate and retrobate, my lord, that um, in order to consent to the revocation of claim one, which they did before waiting to see what the judge did, because they didn't want to spend the trial arguing um, uh, about claim one. For some reason, they thought their position was better in some respects on the merits claim. Um, they uh, accepted that all the conditions for revocation were made out. That's what they had to do in order for the court to have the power to revoke the claim. And it's at that point my clients were entitled to say, well, your admission is that nevity, the obvious development of nevity, brings you within the scope of claim one. Why doesn't it bring you within the scale, claim of the, uh, the scope of claim 12? It's not a procedural matter where I can just admit anything I like. Under the Act, revocation can only take place if invalidity is established. So they admit invalidity, which is fine, but then one says, well, what's the consequence of admitting invalidity? Now, it's interesting, in the Promptu case, which is different because that is more wound up with concession. In that case, Mr. Justice Mead was faced with a subsidiary claim. <clears throat> and the patentee gave up the claim one uh, prior to the conclusion of the trial, prior to the start of the trial, and was relying on a subsidiary claim. I think it was claim 10, claim 13. Uh, gave up one, gave up 11, wanted to rely on 13. And, that, and accepted that they would be revoked. At trial, when it came to closing argument, the patentee tried to set, rely on the validating features in 111 as part of claim 13. And the judge quite rightly said, no, 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 no. You've given up there being any inventive step in claim 1. In any inventive step in claim, uh, claim 11, you can only rely on the difference of the extra integer added by claim 13. That's a perfectly rational and a perfectly sensible decision. In this case, we say, OK, then, you've given up claim 1. What's the difference between 1 and 12? And we're met with there isn't one. Is there anything in paragraph 270 of the judgment which the judge got wrong? <coughs> There's a couple of things going on in 270, my lord. Um, uh, the claim 13 point falls away because actually uh, my learned friends weren't allowed to pull claim 13 back. And that was a concession point which depended upon understanding what the concession was as to when claim 13 fell and when it didn't. That's all fallen away. The issue is between claim 1 and claim 12. And as I say, the issue is unjustness doesn't arise. But as I say, this, this I think this... Well, you say unjustness doesn't arise, and you yeah. may be right about that. If your submission is correct, then you are right about that. Mm. But um, do you quarrel with the judge's conclusion that there would be unjustness or injustice? <coughs> it, the, the problem is the whole of 270, my lord, is about whether or not... Um, I know, I know, but what's the answer to my question? Whether or not it's claim 13. I don't think the judge is saying here... I've asked it twice now. I oh, no, sorry, my lord. Let me focus again. 
do you quarrel with the judge's conclusion that there would be injustice if your legal submission is correct? I, 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 I do quarrel with it insofar as it relates to claim one and claim 12, because I say that the... Um, firstly, it's a, it's a position whereby when a party makes submissions, they need to be very, very careful about the submissions they're making. Secondly, patents are about technical contribution, making a technical invention over the prior art. That's what the validity case is about. And having admitted that claim one has no technical distinction over the prior art, and being unable to show any technical distinction between claim one and claim 12, it's irrational to assert claim 12. What is the effect of the agreement recorded on page 201 of the supplemental bundle? Um, the effect of the um, agreement is that rather than having a sudden death, which of course would be subject to um, uh, potentially subject to an appeal to the Court of Appeal a few days before trial, um, the uh, all opportunities would be open. We had a full trial on claim 12, but that was done as a procedural agreement to ensure that they didn't lose their trial if, uh, if it transpired that they were entitled to run claim 12. Now, the trial judge found here that they were entitled to run claim 12, and there was at least a risk in coming in front of um, uh, another judge on an interim basis. Uh, if Mrs. Joanna Smith had determined that it wasn't open to them to run 12, had conceded claim 1, the trial date would have been lost. Um, was was it was it in in view or considered that, that in conceding claim one they might have been also conceding claim twelve? Yeah, I, th I think that's I think what my law is asking is that that's part two. So part one. Will seek to invalidate claim 12 starting from nevity, regardless of the fact that claim 12 includes similar features to those found in claim 1 or 13. So that's straight to trial on claim 12, just as AIM wanted. But we must we may run an alternative case against claim 12, starting from nevity, in the light of the concessions made by the claimant in respect of claim 1 and at that time yes. and or 13. So I was I was entitled to go to trial as I did and say, claim one's invalid, there's no technical distinction between claim one and 12, end of. And that's what I did say. And the judge at that stage said, um, that's not a correct legal analysis. I mean, I, if, I, if I'm right. Well, I think the point I'm I say, uh, do you say this agreement protects you against the it's all unjust arguments which are being put to you? It, it goes a long way to showing that actually we were acting as reasonably and as fairly as we possibly could in all the circumstances. That this very unusual, and it is an unusual, it's not a normal giving up. This is a consent order. It is a consent order. Which, which, which appears to which appears on, on the face of it, I just wonder if I understood this, it appears to be recording that uh, the validity of claim one would no longer be pursued and that it would be open to you to contend in the light of that concession that claim 12 was also not valid. Yes. It seems to me to make it very difficult to argue that, that, that's, that you weren't entitled to so argue. Well, quite. And we well, I don't think anyone said that you said you were not entitled to argue it. Um, and we have argued it. Well, we did so argue it. But the judge's view, the judge's um, judgment on the issue is giving up claim one has, has really got nothing to do with claim 12. And that's where we disagree with the judge. That's where we say he erred. Because you, ha 
a party just can't give up, proceed, um, uh, bring himself within a statutory test for revocation by admitting the invalidity in respect of a piece of prior art and then say there's no consequences to that. I can simultaneously be heard before the same court to approbate and reprobate and say Nevity's got nothing to do. Well, if you're seeking to narrow scope or to make something more manageable, it's perfectly open to a party to say we will stand or fall on claim 12. We won't seek to mount any separate argument on the basis of claim 1. But that's not what they said. No. And that, that's, that's my point. And Why is it not what they said? Pardon? Why is it not what they said? Well, they've agreed, they've agreed, to, they've agreed to it being withdrawn. Well, th it's been revoked now. Yes. If that's they've agreed, what... They've agreed to it being revoked. Because what else, what, what else could they possibly do? Well, well um, if, um, if uh, uh, my Lord... If, if, they said, if they'd said, look, we'll focus on claim 12, we're not interested in claim 1, you would have said, rightly, well, hang on a minute, what happens if you win on claim 12? What happens to claim 1? And they would have said, oh, we don't care, you can revoke it. The consent is revocation, which is what they did do. So if, if my Lord, um, uh, Lord Justice um, Phillips's point had been taken, we potentially would have gone to claim, uh, to, to trial, on the basis that there was no concession as to, direct concession as to the validity of claim one. There was an issue to be determined, and if it turned out that I was right on um, uh, claim 12 or claim one, whichever way around you did it, the other claim fell with it, and nobody needed to look at any other claim. That's fine, and that's the normal sort of concession people make, which is the point um, uh, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Mayo was raised right at the beginning of these submissions. But that's not what they did. Because if they had have done that, they would be sitting here now with claim one <coughs> and claim 12. The point is, they gave up claim one because they accepted it was invalid under Navity. It has been revoked. The order hasn't even been stayed. It has gone. And I say there are consequences of that. If you make an admission... Well, no, you do, but you're saying it on the basis that the court had no jurisdiction to make that order other than the consent of the party. And I don't agree with you about that, Mr. Nicholson, just to be clear. Well, I'm saying the party... The party could... The, 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 Section 74 of the Act says the only proceedings at which um, the validity of a patent leading to revocation can be put in issue are certain... Yes, and conditions. these are those proceedings, these and therefore the validity of the patent can be put in issue. Exactly. So what's 74 got to do with it? Because the grounds upon which a patent can be revoked... Which is not 74, it's 72. Which is 72. Yes. ...requires the court to be satisfied that the grounds are made out. You'd better show me 72, because I don't recall reading those words. Is it in the bundle? It should be, but it's not. <coughs> Clear. In memory, 72 certainly sets out the grounds of revocation, that bit I follow, but you seem to be suggesting in your submission that somehow 72 precludes the court from, grant, from revoking a patent by consent and requires it to form some view and be satisfied of something, which I find very hard to believe. In fact, I must have been exercising jurisdiction I didn't have quite, a while, quite often in the patents court. Um, the section 72 sets out in permissive terms power, or power to revoke patents on application. Mm -hmm. My reading of section 72, where I can go and ask with my Lord Justice Mayor, is that this is the statutory power to, um, by which a uh, state monopoly granted under the Act, yeah, uh, uh, under the Act, um, uh, can, um, can be revoked. And the end of the section 72.1 says, subject to the following provisions of this Act, the Court of the Comptroller by or may, by order, revoke a patent for an invention on the application of any person, including the proprietor of the patent, on, then come the important words, but only on any of the following grounds. That is to say, and the one that really matters here is that the... Um, the, the, uh, the invention is not a patentable invention under 72.1a. If you go back to uh, not patentable invention is, uh, as my Lord Justice Burris knows, is defined in section 1 of the Act, 
which provides for not new, not invented theft. And given that the express power given to the court is on and only on those grounds, even when the patentee applies, the proprietor of the patentee, uh, the patent applies, I do say the court's power is limited to only revoking it if it is satisfied the patent is invalid. That's but to you, Mr. Nicholson, the, the words only on, what they do is they make that list of grounds a closed list. Mm. Yes. That's what it's for. Yes. And, 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 and that's why the, this is the closed list. There isn't um, uh, you know, an F in this subsection. I'm sorry, I know some of my laws don't have it. There isn't an F because uh, the patentee just is happy for it to be revoked. So in order to found it, in fact. Sorry, Sigurd. I think oh, we have it. now found it. We have it. Oh, I'm grateful, my lord. Um, so because it's on these grounds and only on these grounds, when my learned friend said we wanted their patent revoked, he clarified um, to us and to the court that it was because <coughs> it was invalid over negative. That was the exercise of uh, Mr. Justice Meads under Section 721A because he was satisfied <coughs> that the admission being made by um, uh, AIM was that Claim 1 was not a patentable invention. And I say, you can't admit because you want to that this isn't a patentable invention and not expect the other side to say, well, why, why is Claim 12 a patentable invention? What's the nature of the judgment that you're saying you're entitled to in Claim 12 on this basis? Um, uh, revocation of admissions or what? Re 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 revocation of claim. Well, I, know, I know you want revocation, yeah. but on what basis? Is it, a, it feels to me like it's a judgment on admissions, not a judgment on the merits. It, it, it would, I don't know, you tell me. Yeah, it, would, it, would be on the, it would be revocation as a consequence of admission. Where does that fall in Section 72? Um, because the admission that's given is that the subject matter of the claim isn't a patentable invention, which brings you straight between 72.1a. That's the admission that they've made, you see, my lord. They've made the admission that those integers of the claim laid out, that description, whatever it means, isn't a patentable invention. That means they accept <coughs> claim one should be but I say well, they're the same words in claim 12. If the relevant admission you're making is that no invention lies here, <coughs> then you can't be heard to say, well, there's an invention when it arises in claim 12, but there's not an invention when it arises in claim 1. They're mutually it, it is odd, though, isn't it? Because the result of the trial, mm -hmm. which by virtue of the agreement in the order you agreed would determine the merits as well as the admissions argument, the result of the trial is that the judge has determined that claim 12 is a patentable invention. Um, yes. So and if we, if, we, if we agree with that on its merits, it is a bit hard to see where the admissions argument fits into section 72. I mean, it does become very difficult, and it's often the way when procedurally of procedural convenience, one carries on, notwithstanding the contention that you're not entitled to argue the point. Um, I shouldn't be in any worse position because uh, a pragmatic view was taken that we won't insist upon the determination of this issue at first instance. And if either side are unsatisfied with the result, a appeal to this court maybe even thought beyond, um, in order to resolve what happens when you um, make admissions on uh, ident effectively identical subject, technical subject matter. Um, my client said, look, we're all ready for a trial. We're all prepared for a trial. We're happy for the trial to go ahead on the two basis set out. One you're right, one I'm right. Um, that shouldn't prejudice my learned friends, and it shouldn't prejudice me. It's, that is a pragmatic approach to the situation. But it shouldn't deny my, my clients the right to say, well, in the light of this admission, that this technical subject matter isn't patentable. 
do you say about claim 12? Right. And, and it is a technical point, but I, I say it's a point that only arises very, very rarely. Normally, parties are more careful with how they make their concessions. Um, normally, the claims aren't quite as identical as they are in this case. Normally, the prior if the issue arises, the prior art isn't directed to doing exactly the same thing that the method claim is directed to. Um, and as I say, it can be avoided in almost every case by properly circumscribing the admissions that one's seeking to make. If it was more, um, uh, if it was a bigger floodgates issue, we would have this issue arising time and time again. But the only two cases that we're aware of that has arisen in recently was the prompt use case that came before Mr. Justice Mead. And he thought in those circumstances it was wrong to allow the patentee to try and delve invention back out of the claims that they'd shipped. But they had a difference. These two claims came together identically, and the argument was received uh, slightly less enthusiastically. I'll put it, I'll put it in that way. Um, my lords, um, I've taken that in a slightly roundabout um, way, but I think, um, I think my lords have the points uh, yeah, I wish sorry. to make. Discussed it quite fully. Um, my lords, unless I can be of any further assistance, and slightly later than intended. Thank you very much, Mr. My lords, can I give uh, you a roadmap to begin with and uh, then start on some fundamental points? I don't think I can finish in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, no, well, if you no. Um, tell us what we have to look forward to. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what you, have, what you have to look forward to and, and do a little bit more than that, I, I hope, before. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, as uh, your, your lordships gather, our, our point is that the uh, judge was right for the reasons that he gave um, in relation to. At uh, the first point on uh, construction, uh, he construed the claim in accordance with uh, the language, the specification, and indeed what the uh, uh, experts, and indeed even my learned friend on a show, show my lord, the skeleton in due course, agree to be the core inventive concept of the uh, patent. He did the same with respect to the second feature, that's uh, 12.5, uh, uh, the light on, on dark. And those points can, in, in some senses, go together because they are both about what the inventive concept was and the construction by the judge was in accordance uh, with that. On the basis of that construction, he held, and it's a point that's not appealed, but I will show it to you because it, it uh, has some relevance to the prompt to point that you've just been uh, debating, that there was a good invention, that it was not uh, rendered obvious by the uh, prior art, and in particular, nevity, and that if one was thinking of a, a modifying nevity, one would not do it in such a way as to get something within the claim. That was the nevity plus argument with which you haven't been troubled, and that was not uh, appealed. And in all respectable submission, um, those are the big points in the case, and the judge was uh, uh, clearly uh, correct. On amendment, uh, the judge was also right uh, to say that um, it was not necessary because of his approach to construction of the claim and the uh, way in which the uh, claim contemplated using light from the occluding object, having, in essence, blacked out the background. So what then didn't become necessary to uh, consider the amendment, but had it become necessary uh, to do so, uh, then the amendment would have been a, uh, uh, an appropriate one, and I'll address my lord in relation to the question of active uh, uh, in that uh, context, and of course also in relation to the points that are made on, on certain kinds of colours of black trousers and so forth, which uh, we, were, we were debating, uh, with my, my learned friend was debating with my lords uh, th th this morning in, in that uh, connection. As to infringement, uh, our point is really very simple. This is a system where the uh, defendants could have just used nevity. But the problem, as they recognized, was that nevity is not really that much good in a situation where you have what might be described as a bright occluding object in front of a uh, um, billboard. Um, and so, because what you're doing with the nevity system is using the brightness of the billboard to identify the billboard. And that's why we have in their system the 
uh, additional system, which is essentially making use of our uh, invention, which involves uh, essentially the selective light and dark infrared uh, channels, which enables you then to identify the uh, uh, occluding object, because it is emitting or reflecting um, uh, infrared in such a way that it shows up as a light occluding object in the relevant channel. And that is why the judge was entirely correct to say that although one couldn't tell uh, in advance exactly on the occasions when the infringing method was used, it was clearly used, uh, and uh, infringement was uh, held on that basis. So those are the, the key points on the uh, 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 validity and infringement uh, issues. Then there are two, if I may put it like this, somewhat tail end charge points. There's a Nevity OD uh, point, and my Lord, Lord Justice Burse, has correctly put his finger on a question which was also in the judge's mind, namely, in what circumstances is this point actually relevant? And there's a section in the judgment that asks exactly the same question and is slightly critical of uh, Sapanor and not really identifying. <laughs> The circumstances in which uh, that, that might arise, uh, and I'll try and give my lord some assistance in, in relation to that. It's still not completely clear uh, why that is a point that arises at all, but with my lord's uh, leave, I'll uh, ask Mr. Cronin to deal with that nevity uh, OD uh, point. It was not, I should emphasize, the core uh, uh, argument on the invention and whether there was a good invention in this patent at trial. The core argument that was there at trial was the nevity plus argument. Because there, what was being said is, oh, you would take the prior art system, their system, and modify it so as to bring it within the scope of the claims. And the judge rejected that argument for a, a whole range of reasons. The Nevity OD argument kind of arises, uh, uh, but it sort of only arises if you take a, take a construction that is really a, 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 a very strange construction. And I'll try and identify in the circumstances in which it can arise, because I think there is, there is an issue. And the final uh, tail end Charlie point is this promptu uh, point, where we respectfully submit that the position really is uh, uh, quite unsustainable. Uh, and the argument has become even more extreme during the course of this afternoon, where, where, where it's now said, and, and, and we can see why, uh, that uh, the court doesn't even have the power to, in, in a sense, endorse a consent order for revocation of subsidiary uh, claims of a patent, even in the context of uh, streamlining a, a case. M my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Males, uh, pressed my learned friend in relation to paragraph 270 of the uh, uh, judge's judgment on this uh, issue, which is, it has to be said, an important procedural point, because if my Lord say that uh, it essentially people can be foot-faulted in this way, it will be absolutely inevitable that no one will ever make any concession of any kind in any patent case uh, in the future, because they will never have an insurance policy that could possibly sustain that, because, and for, for two reasons. One is that they might, on my learned friend's case, be held to be wrong in the particular approach that they took to let's say, the effect of claim 39, as it turns out on some construction at, at, at trial uh, on claim 1 or the reverse. Uh, and secondly, because um, it would always create an argument about it, and, and, and arguments at many levels. So the first argument would be, well, what uh, was actually said in the correspondence? And my Lord has seen I also seen a taste of this, where there are, in this case, multiple documents, including correspondence, consent orders, recitals to consent orders, agreements in, in consent orders, the effect of which is uh, uh, disputed. But then there would be a second layer of, of debate as to whether, if a concession had been made in relation to a given claim, it was in fact made on a given basis, namely that there was a uh, 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 invalidating piece of prior art or Possibly that, for example, a given claim was not invalid because of prior art, but because it was, let's say, excluded subject matter or whatever, but another uh, claim, claim 
wasn't, and there would be potentially expert evidence relating uh, to that, and then there would be a further debate about what the impact should be, and indeed what the justice should be, and then one would add to that debate a fourth tier of debate, namely whether, in all the circumstances, it would be appropriate to permit someone who had made a concession of any kind to withdraw the concession. And my learned friend says that this is not an issue that arises uh, very often. Well, it has arisen in Prompto, it's arisen in this case, and I happen to know, and uh, my learned friend Mr. Iverson knows as well, that it arose in a relatively recent patent case called Abbott and Dexcom. Ultimately, it wasn't reflected in the, in the decision, but a point was taken. Um, Iverson was on, on the other side and said, oh, well, if you streamlined your uh, patent by saying you're not going to rely on claims X and Y, that has all sorts of consequences in relation to what you can subsequently say and what you can defend in relation to the prior art. And there was a debate about, uh, about that. Ultimately, it didn't, it didn't matter. But the reason I'm, I make that point to my lords is that your lordships do need, on this point, to be quite careful in what you, you, you say. And I say this with, with, with the greatest respect. Because we'll, if, do that, we'll do our best. <laughs> that, that, that was perhaps an impertinent uh, obs observation. But, but no, what, I, understand, what, I understand what you're saying about the possible implications. What, 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 what is said is, is <coughs> yeah, I think that's clear. Uh, and so my Lord, Lord, Just, Lord Justice Mayles, of course, asked my, my learned uh, friend, do you accept paragraph 270? Uh, and ultimately, I think it was accepted. It, it might be said that there are similar questions which uh, 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 one might ask as to whether paragraphs 271 um, should uh, also be accepted, because Mr. Justice Mead there recognised that it would be unfortunate to discourage patentees uh, in this sort of situation for making sensible submissions about claims uh, other than the main ones for fear of unforeseen consequences. And the issue really here is unforeseen consequences, and I've laid out the four layers of potential unforeseen consequences that arise. And the final point before uh, the adjournment is perhaps this, that it is, it is particularly strange to have a, a point of this kind developed in the light of the arguments that uh, succeeded and failed at trial, where essentially what's said is the, the technical content, claim 12 is the same as that, that of claim 1. And the, the main attack on claim 12, which was the Neverty Plus attack on claim 12, failed on the basis that the skilled person wouldn't think of doing the core inventive concept uh, in, the, in the claim. So with that roadmap, if that's a convenient point to uh, pause, I'll try and uh, yes, thank you, thank speed you very through much. matters tomorrow morning. Right, but we'll resume then at 10.30 tomorrow. Thank you.